All right, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be here till 3 o'clock. We're covering Vermont versus Stephen Burgoyne. Gavel to gavel coverage here at the Law and Crime Network, as always. Okay, welcome back. Uh, that's the medical examiner testifying in the Burgoyne case. Okay, and let's have a law and crime drum roll, please. Because <laughs> we have the inimitable, the mentally nimble, the extraordinarily skilled, the 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 Latin speaking, uh, classic literature giving, food aficionado, lawyer extraordinaire, Gene Rossi. Welcome, Gene. You know what? I'm touched that you think I'm a food aficionado because I like polenta. Yeah, well, you know, listen, uh, I believe a great man once said, hashtag levity is life. Do you know who yes. that is? You're darn right. And I'm proud of it. Yeah, that's one of your uh, one of your monikers. Gene, um, what are you thinking about the case so far? I mean, I, went, I know you were listening when I went down the description of what the insanity defense in Vermont looks like. And uh, we listened to a number of clips of some very compelling testimony. I'm just curious, um, your thoughts on how the case is going? And specifically addressed for me, Gene, we looked at an MVR, motor vehicle recording, of the cruiser that the defendant was in. And while he was going very fast, uh, estimates up to 100 miles per hour, he was able to maintain the lanes, he wasn't weaving, um, things of that nature. Is that relevant at all to the insanity defense? Yes, it is. And Bob, this is similar to that case down in Florida where the flight became a major reason why the individual was found guilty and they rejected uh, the insanity defense. Now in Florida, as you, I, you may have explained, in Florida, it's clear and convincing is the burden on the defense. We now have preponderance, 51%. But I think that flight issue and getting in the cruiser, I think uh, that could be the, uh, the sine qua non Bob. of the prosecution's Bob. argument that they haven't met the burden. No, you didn't, Gene Rossi, whipping out more Latin. Um, I agree. <laughs> hey, let me ask you, Gene, because I find this interesting now. Uh, I could do a deep dive in the legal research of it, but yeah. when they, the, the, Vermont's a little different in the insanity law in that it's not that he couldn't appreciate the rightfulness or wrongfulness of his conduct. Here it says they lack the capacity uh, to conduct themselves, and, and part of this statute says, conform their conduct as required by law. Um, does that kind of mean that they may have known what they were doing wrong and, and that they were fleeing, as you suggest, as consciousness of guilt, as we often say, but yet the mental disease or defect prevented them from, quote, conforming their conduct as required by law, that they could find another avenue to get out of this under this insanity law? Boy, I don't like that statute one yeah. bit. Forget the forget the burden. I don't like the wording. Um, the, the conform to the law, boy, that is a very broad and nebulous and vague word. Um, it gives a lot of uh, leeway for a defense uh, attorney to say, listen, he wasn't able to conform. You know, granted, he took the cruiser, but but the mental mental defect was the main cause, and he couldn't conform. He panicked. He got scared. And I think that's what they're going to say. Yeah, I mean, that, there's, that shows you substantially, Gene, as I was trying to explain to the audience before, when you lower the standard to preponderance of the evidence, making it easier, in other words, for the defense to prove its case, and then you add that little caveated part of the insanity law, to your point, you may have been able to appreciate what you did is right and, or, you know, or wrong, but you were just compelled by this mental disease or defect not to be able to conform. Boy, that gives the defense a very powerful tool if, in fact, that's the law. But Gene Rossi, I'm sorry to have you on so quick and go to a break, but we're going to have more Gene Rossi on the other end of the break. So obviously you're not going to go anywhere. We'll be right back. All right. Uh, medical examiner testified very quick. Um, Gene, we got a couple things to talk about. Let's talk yep. about the last thing first. And I know we got a real practical uh, debate between me and you, maybe, maybe even a difference in trial strategies. But the last point, uh, people were asking in the chat room, like, wow, that's really weird. Why is the prosecutor bringing out information about injuries on the defendant? And um, you heard me blurt out, seatbelt, seatbelt. Um, I think it's another one of those little facts that shows he was thinking, uh, in addition to the fact that he was preserving his life as he's taking other people's lives. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. He knows how to conform his conduct to meet the situation. He wanted to save his own life and take the life of somebody else. That's the argument. 
Okay, so for all of our legal aficionados out there and those who just love true crime and the gavel to gavel coverage they get, Gene Rossi on the Law and Crime Network and great pros like you, um, let's talk about this idea, the stipulation. You heard me saying when we were off camera, boy, I rarely stipulate the things. My philosophy, and I think you may have a counter one, is that I have seen stipulations going to a jury, and that is where both sides agree about the parameters of a particular piece of evidence so it doesn't need to be authenticated. And yet, when the jury comes back, they didn't find in favor of the person entering that item into evidence. I'll give you an example. We have a thousand foot yeah. law in New Jersey. And before you can prove a thousand foot law, some witness has to get up and say, I checked the map created by the city engineer of such and yep. such a city, and it was within 1,000 feet of, of a school and you there is a map and it has it very mapped out with circles where that blue areas are within a thousand feet i saw a prosecutor have a stipulation to that it seemed reasonable it really wasn't a contested fact and the jury came back and found that it wasn't within a thousand feet of a school that's my example well i can tell you that this that was probably jury nullification here's my experience on stipulations and i think we agree you never stipulate to something that's crucial right where you want a witness to describe it. You never do that. But if it's a stipulation to say venue or chain of custody for the for the kilo of cocaine and you have an agent who's a terrible witness and you want to stipulate to chain of custody that was preserved and sealed and all that, I love stipulations. Right. Okay. Now the second reason is, and this is this is advanced trial advocacy for your goal as a prosecutor or a defense attorney is to bond and connect with the jury, all right? Bring it home you quick, Gene. Pardon me? Bring it home quick. Oh, um, I love to read the stipulation to the jury because I'm sort of reading the law to them, yeah. and I'm almost giving like an opening or closing. Okay, well, guys, there you have it. The great Gene Rossi and stipulations. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back.